Howdy YouTube family, it's Bolt SRNA coming to you again with another day's topic. So I get a lot of questions all the time, so I sent out a message the other day on Instagram asking you guys to direct message me and let me know what some of your questions were, and I thought I could get into answering those questions for you today. All right, so before we begin, I wanted to tell you guys why I'm wearing my white lab coat. I never wear this white lab coat. In anesthesia, we never wear lab coats pretty much. Um, it's one of the reasons I like anesthesia. It's a lot less stuffy. You can wear comfortable OR scrubs and you can move around easily and you're not restricted by all these clo clothing layers. But I am meeting with Congress this week, uh, members of Congress for meetings and for CRNA advocacy meetings and things like that. And we have been requested by the association that we're going with to wear our white lab coats and to dress professionally. So I am wearing this. Let me know in the comments below if this looks really stuffy and this doesn't look like something that I should be wearing or if this looks great and this looks like something that you want to go to be an advocate for CRNAs in. So on to your questions. The first question that I have comes from Aaron Navare. He asks, how will I know if my GPA will be acceptable for CRNA programs? I have a 3.56, but I'm nervous I won't be able to make the cut. So the short answer is yes, a 3.5 is gonna be fine, um, especially if you've met all the other criteria in the application that they've set out. So something that a lot of people get set on with GPAs and stuff and forget about is that your application for CRNA school is a whole package of information. Uh, one, one of my videos from a year and a half ago talks about five simple steps to get into CRNA school and it has a lot of details on different things that you can do to buff up your application and, and to make your application look good. So there's a lot of stuff that you're gonna be doing, including the interview process. The interview process is a big part of the application and when you interview, they're gonna be testing to see if you fit their program and if you fit what they want in their program. So while your GPA may get you in the door with a 3.5, that's it's gonna be fine. A 3.5 is fine, especially if you have a bunch of your other CCRN and GRE scores and everything else looks good, then a 3.5 is great. Um, if you somehow scored lower, um, say maybe you have a 3.2. Now 3.2 is kind of a danger area. You're on the lower side of things. They're gonna be investigating why your scores are lower, why your GPA is lower. They may not even extend an interview to you with a lower GPA like that. So in order to get your GPA up, you can take some undergrad chemistries or physics and things like that. If you made a B or a C in those classes originally when you first took them and that's bringing your GPA down, retake them, make an A in them, show them that you can do better now. Um, or you can take, a, what a lot of people like to do is they like to take pathophysiology, but take a graduate level of pathophysiology and then make an A in that class. If you can make an A in graduate level pathophysiology, it shows them that whatever your problems were with studying and, and making a high GPA in undergrad, it shows them that now you're more serious, now you're more focused and you're ready to take on grad school with a more um, serious mindset on studying and achieving better grades. So question number two. Uh, Betty Glick and Rachel Robinson pretty much asked me the same question. What is some advice you wish you had been told prior to starting clinicals? So luckily I was told this advice by somebody and I took it to heart. Um, I think a lot of your professors will give you this advice, but some people just don't really receive the advice and, and really kind of live by it. So it's don't take yourself too seriously um, and don't be too hard on yourself when you start clinicals. A lot of us are, I, well, we're all ICU nurses and we're overachievers and we're ambitious and we're usually type A and OCD and we expect to make an A on everything and be the best at everything and, um, and to, uh, naturally absorb information and skills rapidly and, and move forward and, and you know, continue to do better and better and better and better. And we probably all have a history of being that type of person. So when you start clinicals, especially after you've done, say, a front-loaded program like most of the DMP programs are, you've done a full year of, of intense study and academic research and you've done lots of um, tests and you've pretty much jumped many, many hurdles and memorized lots of facts and, and details and stuff and you feel like you know way more than you, your brain could ever hold of information. And then you start clinical and trust me, no matter how much you thought you knew, you will realize you don't know as much as you thought you knew. 
and what you did know, you don't understand how to apply it in the ways that you need to apply it. And if you manage to be able to apply it to some certain things and you're like really clicking on all cylinders and you can apply it and stuff, you're gonna do it a lot slower than what the CRNA or the MDA who's in the room with you wants you to do it. They will do it 10 times faster than you. Their, their brain will connect those synapses a lot faster than yours does and they will react to treat those pressures or, or intubate that patient in a certain way or whatever it is, the skill that you need to do they're going to do it faster and they're not going to most of them will not wait around on you to connect all the dots and then do it they're going to do it a lot faster especially when you're new because it will take you a lot longer than than probably is safe for the patient to connect all the dots and to get everything done appropriately so i mean and it's going to boil down to putting ekg pads on the patient when they get on the or table uh, the correct position for the blood pressure cuff dumb stuff that you will want to kick yourself for because you for years as an ICU nurse did way more advanced things that was basic nursing school information that you learned and did appropriately then and then worked independently as an ICU nurse doing all those things for many years and then you start CRNA school and suddenly you can't do basic simple things and your cortisol levels are through the roof, you're anxious, you have the whole OR staring at you, people especially in the beginning, um, the, the scrub techs are watching you, the surgeon may be in the room standing there waiting on you with their arms folded because they can't get started until you intubate and you induce and do all your process. Uh, your, your CRNA and your MDA are going to be standing there watching you trying to you know assess your skills and see what you're doing and sometimes they will choose those moments when you're under the most stress to ask you difficult what we call pimping questions they will ask you really difficult physiological questions or kind of test type questions they're going to ask you in the middle of doing all these things with everyone watching you and you're going to be super stressed out so just know it's gonna happen, you're gonna do terrible, you are gonna feel like an idiot the first probably, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably seven months into clinical rotations now and I still feel like an idiot half the time. Um, the other half of the time, I'm getting it, but I, I, I'm constantly kicking myself because I'm never doing it quite as fast as what the CRNA is doing it, and I'm trying to like speed up the time. But there's there's tons of things that you nobody steps into anesthesia and in a day understands it and is great at it and just is a perfect independent anesthesia provider. You will take a long time to adjust to that. Some people take a little bit longer than others. Some people adjust faster, but no matter how fast you adjust, you will be terrible in the beginning. Don't take yourself too serious. Don't berate yourself. You will have plenty of other people who will berate you for, uh, for that um, and will, will help you out in that department of tearing you down. So don't tear yourself down. Uh, stay self-confident, uh, keep moving, and take every day just one step at a time and know that tomorrow's a new day and you may have made terrible mistakes today, but you'll go home and study and work harder and tomorrow come back and be even better. So question number three is from Tayton uh, Prime, Prima, Primal. Um, I think it's a French name. Uh, so the question is, how are you paying for CRNA school? Are there any grants or loan repayment programs? So this is the question that we all ask ourselves when we are thinking of applying to CRNA school. We take one look at tuition rates and we, we hear from other people how expensive it is to go to school. And we immediately are trying to figure out who can I get to pay for this for me? Because I cannot, I could either buy a home or I could go to CRNA school. So people are judging these and saying, you know, I can't afford to, you know, pay for CRNA school. And the truth is, and I did research for years before I started CRNA school about this, there's really no easy fix to paying for student for your student loans. Essentially, what almost all of us are gonna do is you're gonna go to school, you're gonna take out loans, just like people who go to med school do, and then you are going to pay those loans back when you get out, just like people in med school do. I mean, there's a couple caveats. You can join the military if you want to um, and, and work for so many years to repay them back the time that they, uh, that they paid for your schooling. I think it's three, or f three to four years if they pay for your school. Um, and if you're wanting to do career military, that's pretty good because then you can get really good retirement benefits. Uh, there's some talk about certain places that are really rural that might reimburse you some for your education, uh, but I've never met anybody who's done that. I've never heard of anyone successfully doing that as a CRNA. Now as a, as a family practice doctor or a family practice NP, that is probably more feasible, but CRNAs, I, I think 
because we make so much money uh, when we get out of school, there's very few people who have sympathy on us and there's very few people who are willing to pay back our student loans knowing that we can make 200,000 or more a year right out of school. So it's it really boils down to you will pay it back. You will probably be $150,000 to $200,000 in debt, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more than that. Uh, but essentially, you're going to probably fall over in that range when you get done with your doctorate, and you will pay it back. But trust me, there's tons of people out there who have success stories of within two or three years living normal lifestyle, they've paid off all their student loans. So just go into school planning to take out the student loans. They will offer you the student loans through your university. They will cover all of your expenses to live as long as you're not needing $60,000 to live on plus all your tuition paid. I mean, as long as you're living in some kind of normal range of, of lifestyle, they'll give you enough loans to pay for whatever you need to pay for. So don't stress about it. You will be in debt. You'll pay it off. Just apply. So question number four is from Jake Primo. He wants to know at what age did you realize you wanted to pursue this profession? So I always knew I wanted to work in healthcare. Uh, even when I think I was five or six years old, I knew that I wanted to work in healthcare. I didn't really know, of course, at that age what it was going to be. As I was in middle school and high school, I kind of thought about being a psychologist. I knew even back in middle school that whatever I was going to do with my life, I was going to get a terminal degree in it, a doctorate or a PhD, because I always knew that whatever I was passionate about, I wanted to know everything there was to know about it and be the best at it and, and not have more degrees that I needed to go on to school and continue to learn. Uh, so I wanted to be the best at whatever I tried to do, whatever that was going to be. Um, so psychology was the thing I was going to do, I was going to get uh, my degree in psychology. Then I got into freshman year of college, started some psychology classes, worked part time as um, an ER assistant in the local hospital um, to kind of get a, a feel for uh, psych patients and healthcare and things like that. And during that process, <clears throat> I realized how much substance abuse and um, and drug addictions and things like that that go along, alcoholism, that goes along with psych patients. And I realized kind of the ugly truth that a lot of us as nurses have seen with psych patients and with drug abuse is that they, they oftentimes don't get better, they oftentimes relapse, they, um, they oftentimes bring negative effects on themselves um, through, through their own lifestyle choices and stuff. And that seemed to be what a lot of psych patients were and, and it wasn't really the ideal environment of what I was thinking it was going to be. But during that same time, I saw nurses working around me and I saw how they got to do so much stuff. They got to help people in their own ways. They got to also do medical stuff, which is really cool. And their jobs were really versatile. And the more that I researched them, the more I realized that they had <clears throat> tons of upward mobilization so that they can start out at um, a basic RN level. And if you just wanna stay there and work on that field, you know, you can do that. And that is a really re rewarding career on its own. Or if you wanna go all the way up to a doctorate level and practice medicine and be independent and do all these other things you have that ability as well so I went on into nursing school and when I was in nursing school I did a rotation at a surgical center I did uh, I was with a CRNA for the day and that was the first time I had met a CRNA and I watched that CRNA do a brachial plexus block which I thought was terrifying and cool uh, right before our surgery and then after that surgery I then watched the CRNA go and do a colonoscopy and when we were in that room, the GI uh, physician was talking to me and, and telling me, hey, you know, if I could have went back 30 years when I went to medical school, if, if I had known about CRNA back then, I would have just went to CRNA school and done that instead. And he was telling me, you know, you should really look into CRNA. So when your GI specialists are telling you like, hey, look into CRNA, uh, that's something you should do you start investigating. And the more I investigated, the more I realized this was definitely what I wanted to do and anesthesia was my passion. And so that's what I've done. Question number five, what is, no, what things should one study before starting CRNA school? And that's from Katie Vicens. Um, so I get this question a good bit too. People really want to get involved in studying beforehand because they hear about how hard CRNA school is and they think if they study in advance they'll be able to knock out all the hard stuff and or at least take the edge off the hard stuff and make it more manageable when they start school. So the only thing that I would recommend you doing is while you're in the ICU, start paying attention to the drips that you're infusing. If, if you're using phenylephrine drip instead of a levofed drip, Ask why. Figure out what the doctor's reasoning is and why he wanted to use phenylephrine versus uh, uh, Levifed. 
or if you're using dopamine, figure out why. Understand the receptors that these drugs work on. Um, understand the pharmacokinetics of a lot of the drugs that you're giving, the vasoactive drugs and the drips that you're using and propofol and things like that. Start looking up the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics and a lot of those things that probably seem really boring to you now um, and tedious information, you will have to learn that in CRNA school and not only learn it but master it and know everything about it. So if you start learning some of those things now while you're in the ICU, not only will it help you be a better ICU nurse, it's also gonna help you in CRNA school because you're gonna have a good familiar familiarity with it when they start talking about those things and how you're going to manipulate a lot of those things in anesthesia. Question number six. Gary Posey wants to know what is the best ICU for getting into CRNA school as far as procedures, experience, and preparation? So this is something that a lot of people ask me as well. Um, there is really no one ICU that is the best. Um, if I had to pick an ICU that seems to give you a really full experience that's well-rounded and gives you um, a lot of exposure to a lot of different things, I would say a good medical ICU slash surgical ICU. If you can find a unit that has medical and surgical together, there, there are some of those out there, I used to work in one, uh, that gives you a good exposure to a lot of different pathophysiology, a lot of different medical illnesses and how you manage those. It's also going to give you a lot of post-surgical patients, so you'll see kind of what, you'll, you'll get to interact with some surgeons, you'll get to see some of the um, physiology of people post-surgery, uh, maybe even get to look at some of the anesthetic records. You might get to interact with some CRNAs or anesthesiologists and um, see what they're focusing on uh, post-op. So that's, that's gonna be a really great thing. Some people think that CV ICU is the best area to work in. I used to do CV ICU as well and neuro ICU. And I have to say CV ICU is cool because you get to really understand cardiac really well. But the problem with that is a lot of times in CVICU, you, you just are good at cardiac and you get used to your cardiac patients, you get used to that specific type of, of regiment stuff that you do in cardiac ICU and you miss out on a lot of the other pathophysiology and, and medical interventions that you do in medical ICU or surgical ICUs. So. Um, I wouldn't say just working CV ICU is a good idea. If you can work a medical ICU, surgical ICU, and CV ICU, and maybe float between all, and, and maybe work in all three or so, or even throw in a neuro ICU in there sometimes too, um, that's probably your best bet if you can do that, to be the most well-rounded. All right, question number seven. Chris Smith wants to know, CRNA school is crazy long. How do you keep up the endurance of learning? Don't you ever just wanna be done? Um, yes, constantly. That is, uh, the thing with CRNA school is it is an endurance test. Not only is it very difficult, I won't lie, it is very academically difficult, but beyond that, if you can get into CRNA school, they have already decided that you have the academic aptitude to get through the program, you know, with your own IQ and stuff. You can make it, but the problem is endurance. Are you willing to just keep moving every single day? And it will seem like an eternity. You will get to about where I'm at in the program now, which is about halfway through, about a year and a half or so through, and you have about a year and a half left, and you feel like you have never seen daylight before. Like it's, you can't remember a time that you've not been under this giant elephant sitting on your chest that is CRNA school. Um, you will be stressed out all the time. You will sacrifice family time, you will sacrifice birthday parties, weddings, funerals. You're going to not be able to do most things in life that you are normally um, used to being able to do. You're gonna be a crappy brother, a crappy sister, a crappy husband, a crappy wife, uh, a crappy child, a crappy parent. Whatever role you play in life to other people around you, you will essentially be a crappier version of that all through the program because you will become extremely selfish uh, in CRNA school because you have to be. If you will survive, you will have to start focusing on you and your in the CRNA program and everything else comes second. Um, there will be family members who will end up you know, in a hospital or something like that, and you'll have to give them a phone call and check in on, uh, check in on them like that instead of actually being there with them. 
uh, because you can't miss clinical days or you can't miss um, a test that's coming up or you can't jeopardize a day or two of missing of a quality studying because it could throw you off on your test and you could fail out of the program. So at all times, you're under extreme stress. When you submit your application to CRNA school, you have got to be sure that this is all you can see yourself doing in life and that this is the only thing that you want to do and you're willing to sacrifice everything else pretty much to make it happen. If you're not ready to do that, please just save yourself the time, save yourself the headache, the money, intuition loss, um, and the, the trauma that you're going to go through from starting a program and working so hard and failing out. Um, sadly, there were four people in our program. There was 29 of us that started, and now there's 25 of us at this point. And most programs will have two to four or so uh, of people who don't make it all the way through the program. And they're people who were quality, and they're smart enough, and they were capable to do it. Just stuff gets in the way. Uh, marriages happen, divorces happen, deaths happen. Things happen through CRNA school. Um, cancer happens. You have to make sure that you're able to just keep on walking one day at a time and always putting CRNA school first. Um, if you start letting it drop down in priority, that's when you fail out. So just make sure when you apply, it's your dream, you're willing to, for three years at least, sacrifice everything else and make sure you, you achieve your goal of finishing CRNA school. All right, last question, question number eight. Claire Flynn wants to know, she says, I'm here, I'm just learning about RNFA, which is RN First Assist. Um, it seems like it might be just as cool as CRNA. Care to share your thoughts on comparing the different OR nursing roles and why CRNA won for you? So uh, I had vaguely heard about a First Assist uh, RN before I went to CRNA school, but not much and I'd never met one. So since I've been in clinical, I've got a chance to work with tons and tons of first assists because they're almost on every single case you do. Um, a first assist can be a scrub tech who got an associate's degree in scrub tech technology. Um, and then they go on and get an additional certificate in first assisting, which you have to um, do a certain number of cases and you have to, you know, I think some online cor coursework you have to do and maybe even some in classroom work you may do for maybe a year or something like that. It's not a long time, um, but they do that extra certification and scrub techs can then be first assists and their average salary from study.com said it was $44,330 a year. Um, and the job description is positioning and prepping patients prior to surgery, ensuring clear visibility for the surgeon by using instruments such as retractors and sponges. They help control bleeding and they help close the uh, suture, they help close the surgical sites with sutures or staples and they dress the wound after the surgeon's finished. So that's essentially what the first assist does. And a scrub tech usually does it but a RN can do it as well. If you work in the OR as an RN and you wanna go do that certification class too, you can do that certification class as well and also become an RN first assist. So um, you can perform that same role. Now, where some people get a little confused is there's some PAs, physician's assistants, and some nurse practitioners that work in conjunction with the surgeon as like their personal NP or PA and they like they see patients in the office, they round on patients after surgery in the hospital, and on some days, if the surgeon needs them, they'll come in and they'll work as their first assist. So it's not that interesting of a role. Um, I, for a scrub tech, I think it would be really interesting. Like that's a really great role as a scrub tech. Um, if you're an RN and that just seems really cool to you, maybe that's a cool role to do. Uh, as a nurse practitioner, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's maybe something different from the normal day-to-day -day seeing patients and you know that kind of stuff. Maybe it's more of like an active hands-on thing and maybe you just really like to sew so you wanna, you wanna suture those last couple stitches or something, but ultimately it's, it's a much under the role of what an uh, NP is capable of doing and it is much under the role of what most PAs are trained to do as well. Um, it's, it's essentially holding back retractors, which, you know, you may be bent over a surgery for a long time. Your back may be hurting and you're, you know, sweating in all this gown and garb and you're just holding back retractors while the surgeon does what they want. 
Um, and then this, and, and you're going to be like holding the suction for him. If he says suction, you suction for him or, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it's a lot, uh, it's an assistant role. I mean, it's, it's, that's essentially what you do is you assist them. Um, and then when they say suture, they mean like the top layer of skin. So the surgeon has to suture up all of like the deep layers of things that are important to suture before they leave. And then there might be like a top layer of something that you need to suture up. Uh, and that's what a first assist does. Uh, so, and then they'll put like derma bond over it or some gauze or something like that. And that's the first assist role. So it's not like, if you think it's performing surgery or something, or you're doing something independently surgical wise or whatever, that's not what the role is. And, um, and, and you also have to deal with, as a first assist, you have to deal if the, if the surgeon is having a temper tantrum that day or is upset at something or, or drops. Uh, I watched a PA get chewed out one day because the cardiothoracic surgeon was suturing and his fingers and the, the PA was like holding back with a retractor one of the, the, the area so he could suture and his fingers slipped because they were wet and, uh, and the suture broke because the, the skin moved over the site and the surgeon chewed him out in front of everybody. So I'm just saying, if that is something that you wanna do as a PA who has a master's degree or an NP who may have your doctorate, and that may be like your day-to-day -day life you wanna live, then that may be great. Me as a CRNA, that's never um, what I would be wanting to do, um, and it would never, it wouldn't even cross my mind to choose something like that over being a CRNA who's an independent anesthesia practitioner. So, um, so yeah, I never even considered RNFA, but if you're an RN or a scrub tech who really wants to do that, that is a pretty cool thing. If you like to suture some and help out and you like to be more involved in surgery and stuff, that might be something you like. Well, all right, guys, this video has gone on for a while. Um, I have answered all of your questions. If you have any more, of course, you can hit me up, direct message me on Instagram. My name over there is Bolt SRNA, and you can follow me over there. I post uh, stories a good bit about my day-to-day -day life, and I also post pictures occasionally um, about anesthesia topics and things like that. So you can follow me over there, and that's Bolt out. <laughs>